Bailey Norville and Tyler Sharman and Amanda Brooksy, these three beautiful women you get to be surrounded by. Tyler. 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 I'm going to write that down. Okay. They're on your hair. They're on your hair by your name. Oh, they are? Yeah. Okay, Bailey, Tyler, and Amanda. All right. Clues. You told them. I think it, I think it'd be right about where your pen. Till then. Oh, till boy who grows up on a farm has the most privileged of heritage. I grew up on a farm of 320 acres in northeast Nebraska, a farm through which follows the lazy but sometimes raging Elkhorn River, with its attendant sandbars, spots of quicksand, creeks, sloughs, and swamps. Along with two wonderful parents and eight healthy children, there were also pigs, chickens, a few ducks, a goose or two, dogs, cats, muskrats, skunks, coyotes, and hordes of mosquitoes. Mix all that with a dairy business, which included everything from conceiving calves to delivering milk door to door, and season with the glory of raising corn, alfalfa, wheat, oats, cockleburs, sandburrs, and sunflowers. Spice it up with the burning desire of parents to determine that each child, come hell or high water, will have a college education. Need in the Great Depression and the drought of the 1930s, and you have the ingredients for one whirlwind of a time. The morning of July 18, 1915, brothers Buck and Barney were sent to our neighbor's neighbor with a, with a message. We went fishing last night. You may have the catfish, but this time we will keep the sucker. His name is Bill. You may take the boy off the farm, but you can't take the farm out of the boy. I am writing this in my later years, looking back on what I consider a very blessed life. This is an anecdotal approach to relating how two young people, my dad and my mother, gave their lives to raising a family of nine children. This they did during the first half of the 20th century on a farm three miles east of Tilden and 25 miles west of Nor Norfolk, Nebraska. Our family, social and natural environment was rich almost beyond description. Perhaps there always has been and always will be stress, discouragement, enjoyment, and rewards in raising a family. Now at the end of this century, it seems the social forces pulling a family apart are overwhelming to all, but those most devoted and committed to the values expounded in the New Testament. Some checking with siblings has been done, but these descriptions which have been told over and over to our grandchildren are from my point of view. Hopefully the sprinkling of imagination will not render them unrecognizable to those who shared them with me. That determination, drive, and mutual respect instilled in us remind me of Winston Churchill's advice to the boys of Eton. Never, never, never give up. probably six years old, my mother said, when we moved to the new house, that would be the house where I was born, there was a, oh, the older children had to learn a new word, flush. The toilet. <laughs> when the oldest girl was four years old, she then, she said, jumped up and said, Mama, I swallowed a pin and bing, she was gone. That's what it was. And I thought, well, I won't walk home tonight. I'll ride home with Mom. And she didn't come and didn't come and didn't come and didn't come and didn't come. And I got a little nervous about it. But anyway, when she came, we got in the car and we drove a half mile home. She said, we're late and I hope Dad isn't upset. And he got down and looked me right in the eye and he said, now, I'm just too angry. I can't whip you now. But next Friday, I, you remember, you've got a date with me next Friday. 
And when I came home, my brother was reminding me of this. Dad never looked at me, never uh -oh. did anything. Uh, oh gosh, maybe he forgot. So he cut the switch and cut the branch, leaves and everything off of it. Then he came over to me and he said, now, you did something wrong and somebody has got to pay for it. Somebody's got to be trimmed. Either you trim me or I'll trim you. Well, I knew what my dad's trimming were because I'd had plenty of them and I didn't like that very well. And what he th had in mind, which I found out later, was that I would say, well, you trim me and you're always going to throw the switch away and not trim anybody. I said, I'll trim you. <laughs> so, oh, well. so I switched my dad about three things and then I threw the switch down and broke out the ball. We were a very close family. When my uh, oldest brothers went away to college, <clears throat> one of them and then the next year two of them, and a couple years later a third one, my mother said, you must write me every week. <laughs> and she said, uh, let's start around Robin. And as more kids went to college, there were more letters in there. That went on starting in about 1930. And when 1997, it was still going. The bomber's objective was not to try to shoot down German fighters, yeah, it was to destroy the German manufacturing capability. Okay. So I was a little older. On our first mission, we got shot up a little bit, and we had a tail gunner, a fellow riding leg on his belly, shooting guns out like that behind him, and the enemies were flying up and they were shooting into the, our airplane, they were hitting these parts of the airplane right there. He got sick, so scared, he got sick. Um, but I was older, I think that was the reason, and I was raised on a farm, which I think made a difference. So I don't recall ever being scared. And all of it protected us was this thin aluminum yeah. You can stick an ice pick through it, but it was, you couldn't see through it, so you didn't rely on it. Were you ever injured? No. Good. Never. Went through the thing, just never. Amazing, just amazing. I said, the Germans can't make a bullet to get me. <laughs> <laughs>